Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're listening to Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. In this episode, I'm joined by KB Wagers, author of A Pale Light in the Black. It's a good vibes military space opera that follows the Near-Earth Orbital Guard, or NEO-G, essentially a spacefaring coast guard protecting humanity within our solar system. The Neo G crew of the interceptor ship Zuma's Ghost prepares for the annual boarding games, a multi military competition which carries huge prestige, bragging rights, and useful interbranch clout. But this tight knit found family faces destabilization as their lieutenant commander is promoted off the ship and replaced with Maxine Carmichael, a capable but awkward young woman whose family name carries a great deal of influence and baggage. As Max works to gel with the team's volatile mechanic and a conflicted captain, their Neo G missions uncover a strange pattern of interconnected mysteries. Captured smugglers who die suspiciously in military custody, colony ships lost for generations turning up without their suspended animation crews, and corporate intrigues that might just connect with Max's own family's lucrative enterprise. A Pale Light in the Black is diverse and accessible science fiction that arrives March 3rd from Harper Voyager Books. And KB, welcome to Fictitious. Thanks so much for having me. So I just wrote a 85,000 word dissertation on your story. What did I miss? What did I get wrong? Uh, where can you fill in the blanks on A Pale Light in the Black? Swords in space. <laughs> oh, they're swords. I didn't even think about mentioning swords. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's all right. You covered everything else. Like <laughs> That's been my pitch for the book for about the last six months is because it is a relatively complex novel and there's so much stuff to cover that distilling it down into that quick little, you know, 15 second thing is super difficult. And we were just talking about this on Twitter yesterday. Like, <laughs> Somebody else does it and it sounds so good and they ask you to do it and you're just like, I have, I have no idea. Let me make this super confusing for you and <laughs> not at all interesting. So you did a fabulous job there. <laughs> well, and it's worth mentioning. I, I really like that element where you talked about like when the, the Neo G team, when they have to board a new ship, guns in space, at least projectile weapons in space are just a super bad idea. Like there's no way that that anybody is happy once one of those things get fired. So swords actually make sense, like right into this buccaneering way into smuggling and hijackers and whatnot, like the best way to handle it is going to be swords because firing a gun is just a pretty good chance to get yourself spaced and out of an airlock. So yeah, I, I, I do like that element. And and then thinking about that, I was like, oh, where do I add this in that, you know, they're sword fighting to, I'm like, I don't even know, like there's there's so much to cover. Yeah, we'll just throw it in at the end. And that's, it, since it's a near future it's set near future, you know, it's only the 25th century, which is realistically not that far off. And the earth is still sort of recovering or has recovered from this thing that we call the collapse. We don't have the pew pew laser guns going on. And so that seemed like the best way to handle it. I do want to make a quick interjection because you mentioned like discussing these things on Twitter. And that is that I interacted with you on Twitter just recently because I had picked out a pop culture reference right off in the first chapter, which was a Hobbs and Shaw kind of joke in the names. And I was the person to throw that gif at you because I was like, I was reading through that first section and I was like, there's a couple of these throwaway characters and they're like Bozen and Hobbs and Shaw. And I was like, w w wait a minute here, wagers. What are you doing? <laughs> That was you. That's awesome. <laughs> there really is a lot of that in this and, and all the other stuff that I write, too, that uh, a fan of mine on, on our Patreon Discord channel just hit me with the Indiana Jones scene where he where the guy's like doing the sword thing all fancy and Indy just pulls it out, gun out and shoots it. And she was like, I saw that, <laughs> <laughs> which is in uh, Down Among the Dead, um, which is one of my Hale Bristol novels. And so, yeah, I was like, yes, yes, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked up on a few more as I was as I was reading through this. But yeah, that was certainly one that got me right off. And I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Well, and you're the first person besides my editor who has said something about it so that oh was my gosh oh i feel so special now <laughs> it's like being in the comment section and yelling first right like i got that moment where like yeah i'm the guy who got it excellent yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh to jump back to the actual proper part of the story i mean you started talking there for a second about that this is a near future and just a few centuries away and yeah there's like there's a big background in here that you're you're mentioning like this sort of collapse of a 
previous version of society, how humanity has rescued itself and taken itself to the stars. These things, I would say, like are definitely the foundation and building blocks of the story, but not necessarily super omnipresent in everybody's mind because these are people with jobs and things that they need to do. And it is a military sci-fi as filtered through space opera, I guess. Maybe it's space opera as filtered through military sci-fi. I'm not sure which way that particular alchemic setup goes but um can you kind of give me a, a a little bit more of a an idea of like how this world works how this uh, background has affected things um basically just kind of the, the world building of it what is the world that your characters in the neo g are living in so when i approached the like creation of the world and how things were laid out i decided to kind of treat it the same way we treat the black death right if you say the Black Death, most people know what you're talking about in concept. But the the amount of people who know a whole lot about what happened in the Middle Ages during the plague, that's a much smaller subset of people. And so I looked at the fact that even with our ability to hold on to information and pass information from one generation to the next, stuff gets lost and you don't pay attention and, you know, you ask me what happened 400 years ago in America, even. <laughs> I can't tell you. I know that there were First Nation peoples living here, but I couldn't give you names and I couldn't tell you like the, you know, everything that happened. So I very much rooted it in this idea of the now, you know, people just living their lives and doing what they are. And Jenks kind of provides that bridge for the 21st century reader because her fascination is with the period of time that happened right before the collapse, which is essentially now, <laughs> <laughs> just in case that freaks you out. <laughs> like, Cause some days I wake up and go, Oh shit, this is not going <laughs> to go. Well. And so, yeah, so we, you get some references and you get the sense and there's a couple of mentions of the collapse, but I don't really go into it. I don't talk about it a whole lot. There is no long expository point where somebody explains to the reader what has happened and why we are living in the world that we're living in now. Yeah, I like like you mentioned that there's a character named Jinx who is um, one of like I would think it was the three leads of the story um, and who is super a super volatile very impulsive, ready to fight uh, mechanic who is also, like you said, like the one person who is really tied into the history and, you know, digging into that stuff. And uh, it made me think of, uh, are, are you familiar with Alex Harrow? Wrote the uh, 10,000 Doors of January. I am. Yeah, we're friends on Twitter. Yeah. So Alex is is very entertaining. And I saw a Twitter thread from her recently where she was talking about how like uh, her brother pulled out like a history nerd reference and she freaked out about it because she was like, no, no, I'm the history nerd of the family. How dare you? And it just turned out that he was actually referring to something in Magic the Gathering that did have a historical basis. And I love that place where like history nerd meets pop culture meets like that identity of the person who wants to delve back into knowing all this stuff versus the people who are firmly rooted in the now. So I really like that you use Jinx as a method to to give us those ideas, but without ever kind of beating the audience over the head with, OK, now here's 300 years of backstory that you need to know. Like, you know, you just you need this much and and you're good with that much. And I think that helps to keep the positive vibe of this story. Uh, I, I like that about it. I mean, there is like there is a military sci-fi kind of aspect of this. The Neo-G seem to be inspired by the Coast Guard specifically. Um, what was your own personal influence in bringing that in? Did you kind of research modern stuff? Um, was there something in particular that really kind of brought this story together for maybe real life stuff? So the the fun thing about this story is that it – it basically started with a phone call from my agent who was like, hey, David Pomerico at Harbor Voyager wants to talk to you. You have to sign an NDA first. I was like, <laughs> what <laughs> is going on? And things kind of progressed and I got the information and we talked about it. And past Katie was like, this is a great idea. You can totally write two books in a year and work a full-time day job. No problem. <laughs> Present Katie is still questioning the sanity of that choice, but would not change it for anything. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
And yeah, so David approached me with with this idea of the what was essentially the Space Coast Guard and the boarding games were kind of his two big ideas. And pretty much when I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do this. He threw it at me and was like, have fun, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, do it. And it, it's, it's basically imagine if somebody handed you the idea for Star Wars or Star Trek and told you to go. And so I I basically got invited to write an IP, but I got to create the IP and I own the IP or, um, you know, a percentage of the IP. So the, yeah, the long, like the long-term prospects for this are really exciting. And at some point we're hoping we can invite other writers in to play in the games and, and do all that sort of stuff. But yeah, when we talked about like where the world was going to be set and that we wanted it to be kind of close earth, either inner solar system. And then there is some mention that humans have gone to Trappist the, but the majority of this story takes place in the solar system, either on earth or at Jupiter station. The idea of the coast guard seems pretty natural because they are the ones who do this. They are the ones who, uh, you know, patrol, the edges. They are the ones who protect the property. They are the ones who um, rescue people. And it just kind of came about really naturally that this would be the best um, branch to focus on that. And you frankly just don't get a lot of books about the Coast Guard, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that you get this. We always see the, the Navy or the, you know, the Marines doing all the cool stuff. Um, I suppose occasionally the Air Force gets in on it, too. But (laughs) uh, (laughs) it's nice to be able to kind of play in an area that does not get touched very often. You mentioned the the boarding games in there, too. And first off, that that origin story, as far as having an editor coming to you with it and then extrapolating from those initial ideas is really interesting. Like that's that's definitely a fascinating one. But the boarding games, this is this is a very different angle within this particular story. I've seen somebody compare this to like being like sort of like the Expanse meets Ender's game. I think there's a much more positive kind of vibe to this story than there are in those. But like integrating this idea of games, like, I mean, we've seen it in, you know, similar kind of concepts in science fiction and and stuff in the sense that like, I don't know, I guess you even say games and I feel like you're like, oh, Hunger Games, are we killing people or is that what's going on here? You know, like, no, nothing so cynical (laughs) as all that. But it's definitely a different angle in this. And having a, a group of people like the Neo-G who are out risking their lives on the frontier of, of the universe, but the internal talk is all about them like, oh, man, we got to be good for the games. Like, it's so very basic human in a way, like, because uh, it feels like in real life, like you've got people who are doing crazy things and then they're just really concerned about their fantasy baseball team or something like that. It just it's like where you put your priorities. So can you kind of talk a little bit more about these games, why they're so important to the Neo G and other people involved in this and then how that reflects on the rest of the story? Because like I said at the top, it's pretty complicated as far as how many moving pieces there are. Yeah. So the the boarding games ended up being a lot of fun. And I it's it's so funny because I frequently talk about how this book is like dodgeball, but it's not anything like dodgeball, obviously. <laughs> There's no, like, <laughs> dodgeball is in a world all of its own. <laughs> <laughs> if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> right? But there were, like, you you get that feel, I, I like to think. And especially, like, the two sportscaster guys that I use for the main games are, are very much patterned off of, of cotton and pepper from dodgeball um, like, <laughs> possibly a little more serious but you know not by much and i i've taken to like responding to neo g stuff on twitter with dodgeball gifts because i feel like it is in keeping with the tone of the book so, <laughs> but you've also got stuff like top gun right which was such a big deal and it's kind of that same thing and like you mentioned the, the folks that i know who are in the military because I didn't serve myself, but I have a lot of family members and I have a lot of friends and my partner was in the Air Force for 12 years. And that is really the all encompassing thing of folks who serve, right? That there's this serious part of the job and they do their jobs and they're good at their jobs. And 
then they're talking in the mess hall about their fantasy football league. And it's a big freaking deal. <laughs> <laughs> or they're orchestrating some kind of weird competition in the barracks. The amount of stories that could be told and probably never should be told to protect people is, <laughs> is all over the place. So when we started putting together kind of the idea for the boarding games and how this would work and how it would function and why it would be something that is so important in the world, obviously, from a military structural standpoint, it does the job of keeping people on their toes, keeping them trained, keeping them focused on what the job is. And the boarding games were initially kind of created as a way to demonstrate, like, who was the best at this. Now, the Neo G has that advantage because they are expressly designed, especially the interceptor crews who are the main competitors in the boarding games. The exception to that, as folks will see, is the members of Honorable Intent, who is the like Intel team and kind of the headquarters team. Um, and they are not interceptors, but they still manage to compete at that same high level. So that's their job, right? They, they board smuggling boats, they rescue people, they do all the things. The boarding games are broken up into sword fights, cage matches, hacking competition, a piloting competition, what they call the boarding action, which is essentially like two teams going up against each other. And then what they call the big game which we envisioned as kind of a puzzle slash escape room type of situation. Um, that made me think a little bit of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to say it all wrong. There's the thing in, in Star Trek where they have got, is it the Kibo Mayashi? I'm going to say it all wrong. Like there's some Kobayashi sort of- Kobayashi Maru. Yes, there it is. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> um, that, that idea of like, you know, putting you up against like the insolvable puzzle and figuring out how you deal with that situation. And I got those vibes when I was, I was reading. I mean, and again- like I'm making, you know, another pop culture comparison. It's not the same thing by any means, but it echoed with me in that sense of like that spot where you take the elite and then you put them against a situation that feels almost insurmountable to see who rises to the occasion and how they problem solve as a team. Yeah. And we because this is the first book, I feel like the the lens on it is pretty wide and you see kind of there are are moments where where I pulled the focus in pretty tightly, you know, Jinx's cage matches, especially were kind of the highlight of this book. And Rosa's sword fights, because it factors into the plot and their character development. But we tried to kind of get everything that was happening in the games into the book. So we kind of had to pull back pretty far in terms of what we were showing the readers. And it'll be exciting in the future to kind of see a book that's entirely about some kind of unsolvable puzzle for the boarding games, for the big game. And that's it. That's all that the book is about, which will be, you know, a whole lot of fun, I think, to read. But for the time being, you have a novel that has a lot to cover, you know, we've mentioned Jinx. You just mentioned Rosa. At the top, I talked about Maxine, um, but we haven't talked about her too much in conversation yet here. In a lot of ways, this is a like a new kid in town kind of story where this character of Maxine enters uh, this, you know, kind of rough around the edges, but very lovable interceptor team and is doing so in a sort of a displacement of the, the previous sort of beloved team member who happens to be Jinx's brother. And so you've got a story of a, of a person trying to come into their own and get over their own introversion and awkwardness. We have this greater mystery that's kind of building alongside of it. You have the boarding games and how much this matters to everybody involved. That's a lot to juggle. And with three three POV characters and I mean, technically four, because uh, the Nika character early on is also a POV. So, I mean, how do you manage the pacing and balancing out all of those things? Because you've got a lot of beats to hit and a lot of, of story to construct in going in several different directions. So how do you how did you put that all together? How did you make that work? <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, how do you do that? Well, edit, <laughs> edit. That's how you do that. None of this stuff looks very good when you put it on the page the first time. I actually, I wrote A Pale Light in the Black right on the heels of finishing up Down Among the Dead, which is the fifth book in, well, I say fifth book. It's the second book in the Fairy and War trilogy, um, which is part of the Hale Bristol Space Operas. Those are all very tight first person 
POVs. Um, and Down Among the Dead is relatively brutal. And it was a hard book to write. And it was a lot of really personal stuff and a lot of grief. And I jumped out of that book and immediately started writing A Pale Light in the Black because I didn't have much of a choice like that. <laughs> <laughs> That because past me, remember, we were talking about past me and, and their great ideas and not so great in practice. And so I, I really just started writing. I had been kind of doodling and coming up with characters and ideas and things to happen. And it, no one is surprised when I say Jenks was like, hey, how are you? Like <laughs> on the page, in front of everything, full on you know, as brilliant as her mohawk. And and so there was no trouble there, like absolutely fine. And then obviously kind of had to figure out like who the vehicle for the story was, how are we going to introduce readers to the Neo G and everything that's going on? If you have this established crew um, and then Max showed up and Max is I keep joking that like Max and Jenks are like the extreme ends of my own personality, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which it would just entirely true, but the essence of it is there. Um, and Max became this amazing foil for Jenks and this amazing character who kind of takes the reader through everything that is going on. Rosa was a little bit more difficult to get on the page, uh, which also, I feel like is not a huge surprise, just given her her tone and her tenor and and how like solid but um, self-effacing she is as a commander. She definitely feels like that person who is always there to bolster everybody else up, but is not very good at taking credit for any of it. And in fact, kind of flatly refuses to like take the spotlight or be in charge. So yeah, we it wasn't really so much a conscious decision in terms of the POVs, so but that the voices just started coming and started putting themselves on the page. And then I realized, like, these are the people that we want to follow through this, um, which isn't to say, like, the rest of Zuma's ghost, Ma and Safi and Tamago aren't amazing characters also, but they just they didn't have as big a part to play in terms of the narrative. I ended up not like making it even more difficult on myself and trying <laughs> to do like six people, which probably would have, I, I feel like David at some point would have been like, yeah, no, we need to cut this back. <laughs> you have some, some really hard contrast between these characters because with Maxine, Max is the, the child of a very prominent family. They own this life X company that has this technology that has expanded people's lives decades longer than than normal and it's a big factor in, in everyday life for people and often a, a motivating factor for them in doing military work and stuff like that is their ability to gain access to this stuff and her parents are like naval admirals and are not very keen on the fact that she's part of the neo g uh so she comes from intense wealth and prestige but no love really in a family background and not a lot of appreciation for what she's doing Jinx, on the other hand, comes from the street. She was an orphan who got adopted into the family of, of this other neo Geer, uh, Nika, and so is much scrappier, is a lot more intense, is very self-assured because she's been able to survive on her own. Um, and found family seems to be a big theme in this story, and it certainly is the thing that matters intensely to Jinx because this is her family. Maxine's sort of running away from her family. Jinx is sort of defending hers. And then Rosa, the captain, like you said, is this person who is in incredibly gracious and, and, and supportive of her own people, but not necessarily that supportive of herself at times, uh, while her family, her wife and her children are back on Earth and her own personal faith doesn't really – like the fact that she's even in space. So um, I think those are really big dichotomies to to balance across all of those. Um, and I, I think that's what makes a lot of this interesting. But that's also a, a lot to carry uh, while you're figuring out all these characters and then to manage all those POVs. Yeah, it's edits really do help. And they kind of smooth everything out. You know, you I tend to have an what I, I guess is a natural talent to figure out voices of characters and have that shine through. Stuff will occasionally bleed together and it's during edits that you separate that back out and figure out like, oh, 
like when we were doing edits, there there were notes that like, why is everybody winking in this book? <laughs> and it's like, well, let me tell you, because my brain latches onto words and then decides to use them over and over again. I'm reasonably sure I'm not alone in that. I think every author t- talks about having that like one word or two words that you just repeat over and over again in a manuscript. And then when you're doing edits and copy edits, you have like, where, why are there 400 uses of the word shrugged in this? I don't know. Oh my gosh. As a reader and book reviewer, let me tell you, if there's one thing that like makes me batty, it's when I feel like a book didn't actually go through enough of an editorial process to find that. Like one very popular book that came out last year that uses the word shatter about 70 times in its third act. And I was just like, how did this pass muster? Like, how do you let this very specific word go this often? But, you know, but I get it in the drafting process, how like if something's just in your head and it's there and you don't see it until the the next way, for sure. Right. And so then like basically then I just go back through and I'm like, wait, okay, who's the winker in this? whole situation if you and obviously if you're gonna pick like out of those three people who is the person who winks the most it's gonna be jenks max on the other hand is gonna be the one who's slightly more prone to crying about things (laughs) although well maybe we had some discussions about that too like (laughs) she cries when she's happy i'm like a lot of people cry when they're happy (laughs) thank you waving my own flag my own little happy tears flag but uh I'm a big believer in walking that fine line between letting your characters have their voice and have their lead and do like sitting back and letting them do what they want with the opposite end of that, which is you are the writer and you are in control. And that whole, I can't control my characters thing is a load of horseshit. (laughs) (laughs) And if I tell you to do something, you're going to do it. Or we're turning this book around and going home. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that you like the further you get into the story, the more you learn about the characters. And, you know, for me, that was part and parcel of figuring out, like, what does Rosa want out of all of this? How Rosa was the one who was the furthest from anything that I could identify with personally, because her faith is is not something that I share. I don't have children. I don't. All of that stuff to me was was a lot more difficult. But she still ended up, I think, shining so well and being such a nice presence on the page. Whereas like with Jenks, it was easy to read her. And you initially think she's super just out there. Everything's out there. But she ended up being a lot more complex than I had initially assumed. And I I didn't want her and Max to be at odds for too long because that's such a, you know, that whole like women fighting with each other over whatever. And Jenks for all her mistrust of new people and mistrust of Max, especially because of where she's, how she's grown up and the fact that she's a rich person. And she is kind enough at heart that it doesn't take her too long to realize how desperately Max needs people in her life. And to make that choice of your part of Zuma now, we'll fight the world together. Um, I want to step over to one other little world building thing, just because this is something that interests me. You know, we see a lot in, as we break down the categories of science fiction or fiction in general, we often see that there's sort of this breakdown between like military sci-fi and like space opera and military sci-fi tends to have a harder science fiction kind of edge. And the audience really wants to know how the faster than light drive works or like, you know, they want to know all this specific stuff. And over in space opera, uh, space opera fans are like, cool. Does it do a thing? That's fine. That's all I need to know. Just tell me that it works this way and I can go along for the ride because I feel, I mean, this is space opera, but it sits in, this adjacent connected kind of military sci-fi space. I said space too many times. This zone. How about zone? Let's go with zone. I was already doing the thing. I was like, I'm using the word too many times. <laughs> Do you, are you thinking about the audience when you're going for us? Like, like how it's going to be marketed? Is this like an editorial thing where you're like, what do the people who are going to come to the store, what are they going to be looking for? What are they going to be expecting? What are they going to be missing? If they're like, oh, this is Coast Guard in space. Well, cool. I'm in for this. And they're like, I don't know. I don't understand how the faster than light drive works or how do they get to Trappist or what's this wormhole thing that they kind of passingly referenced? Is that a concern in there? Is that just a natural part of the story? Is that something you talked about with David? Like, how's that work? 
you know, I resist the urge to label this book as space opera for a couple of reasons. I always look at the split between space opera and science fiction as like the Star Trek Star Wars divide, right? That we may not know exactly how the warp cores work, although I'm sure probably somebody out there who's way more of a Trekkie um, <laughs> Oh, they than definitely I am do. They definitely would be do. like, oh, no, we know, we know. <laughs> but in the show, we don't get that like super hard ass description of how this works. Whereas nobody knows how midichlorians work. Let's be honest. That <laughs> It's just space magic. Uh, <laughs> you said the dreaded word, midichlorians. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst swear we've said on this show so far. Oh, yes. Excellent. <laughs> um, and so the Neo G isn't like hard science fiction at all. But I do feel like it is military science fiction because the setting is military based. All the characters are military. You know, we're very heavily focused on that whole situation. But we're not doing hard science. And don't get me wrong. I, I love me some science. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there are a lot of folks out there who want to read more science fiction, but are hesitant to pick it up because they think that they're going to run into stuff like that, where you get 15 pages of let me explain to you how this works. And you're like, I just want to know, is the punch going to connect? Like, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he threw the punch on page five and we're still talking about his cyborg arm by the time we reach 20. And I don't know if he actually punched the guy or not. And I have completely lost interest. <laughs> now, there are people who really enjoy that kind of stuff. But I feel like to make science fiction more accessible to folks who are maybe looking for the same kind of adventures that we see in Star Wars or even in like a lot of the comic book stuff nowadays, that having that stuff that is it's basically soft science fiction. It's got the science in it because there is some, but it's not space opera. There's no magic. There's no aliens. There are swords. There are swords, <laughs> <laughs> but they're very practical swords. <laughs> we have a scientific reason for using these swords. Yes, Darn that's it. that's true. That's true. <laughs> so it brings it it brings it all back down to earth, so to speak. Um, I feel like there's so many umbrella terms these days that sometimes it's super hard to qualify. I do know, like marketing wise. Harper Voyager has been very clear that this is like military science fiction and that's what they're it's it's all shelved in the same space, obviously. But if you're comparing and contrasting it to my books that are with Orbit, which are the Hale Bristol books, those are pretty solid space opera. Like we're we don't get into a lot of other things for it. With all of the stuff that you had to manage, what was your outlining process? Like, what is what is your writing pro? Oh, you made a face. Okay, this should be good. How do, how do you typically put something together? Did this follow that same path? Are you doing a similar process each time? Are you reinventing the wheel? Like, how does this work? I am a notorious non-outliner. It, it made me laugh really hard because I was I was listening to your episode with Alex actually this morning just to kind of get a feel for the podcast and everything. And, and was hit with this like massive wave of imposter syndrome because she's so <laughs> smart. And so like every, she was talking about like how much research she had done and how well thought out it was. And I was like, my outlining process looks like the GIF of the truck that's on fire. That's just like barreling down the road. That's <laughs> <laughs> literally what my outlining process looks like most of the time. <laughs> I did ironically have to write outlines for David um, for both this book and the next Neo G book that I'm writing right now. And, and bless him. Everybody knows how bad I am at it. So there's always this like heavily weighted, here's what I think is going to happen. Don't quote me on any of it. Like, <laughs> It may take a sharp left turn and we have no idea where we're going. I do what's called a running outline or what I call a running outline, which is where I just start writing and I will keep some bullet points in the document itself as I'm going that kind of there's usually two chunks. One is like the immediate chunk that talks about like the next couple of scenes that are going to happen 
And then there's usually another set of bullet points down below, which have bigger moments in the book that I'm trying to get to. Everything shifts and changes and gets blown apart or disappears entirely because somebody asks a question and I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, let's let's go that way and follow that whole thought process. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I do not do a whole lot of outlining. Um, we were working on this in 2018, I think, maybe like in the middle of contract negotiations. And so I was doing a lot of outlines and and ideas for the story, um, or not outlines, I was doing a lot of notes um, for what I wanted to do, what I thought the characters would do. I didn't really start writing until like January of 2019. And then I turned it in like in April of 2019. So it was, I just basically wrote it and then we went back and fixed whatever was wrong with it <laughs> or most of what was wrong with it. I'm sure there's still probably some stuff that's wrong with it. That is the short messy version of how my quote unquote outlining process goes. <laughs> so is it fair to say that you don't have a particular plotting methodology, you know, whether it's like three act, four act, save the cat, 15 beat, any of those kinds of things. Like, is that, is there, is that figure in at all? Well, the Hale novels follow the three act structure pretty closely because it it fits with the story and the narrative that I'm telling in that particular set of books. For this one, I, I didn't really. Um, and I don't in general go into a story with any kind of plotting method in mind. I just start telling the story. And then what are your tools of the trade? Like, what do you actually write in? What software? Do you ever do anything by hand? Or what kind of note taking? Any of that stuff? I am super old school and I use Microsoft Word. <laughs> 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 Which, <laughs> you know, I, I tried Scrivener at one point and oh my God, it was such, I don't know, that maybe I'm too old. Maybe the learning curve is just too much for my brain in the middle of every. I just didn't like it at all. And so I use Word. Um, I use pen and paper and uh, thank goodness for smartphones because like the fact that I can write notes on my smartphone takes away the, what used to be an enormous pile of scraps of paper where I would write down whatever I could think of. And now I actually have, you know, access to Google docs and, um, and a note taking app on my phone and all of that. But I also, I tend to use a uh, bullet journaling format. Um, when I'm, creating story Bibles. And so that like the Neo G has a whole, a whole notebook full of various things that some of which made it in the story. Some of which was just background stuff that needed to get sussed out in my head. Um, for this particular book, I ended up using a lot of sports brackets because <laughs> <laughs> as I read, as I yeah, as I realized one like Saturday afternoon, I need to know where everybody is at any given point during both the preliminaries and the um, boarding games. And then what ensued was like a five hour long project of putting out brackets for like the 45 cage fighters who fight in the preliminaries because that seems like a good idea to have like three people on each team and you have 15 teams. And my brain was suddenly like, Oh my God, you have to like come up with all of these names. And I actually threw a call out on Twitter and a bunch of folks like gave me names to use <laughs> just so I could fill in the brackets. But that way I knew like if, if somebody was cage match fighting over here, they could not be participating in the boarding actions at this point. Because, it, yeah, like at some point I realized you actually need to know and you need to know who won what matches so that you knew where the progression was. Obviously, we kind of know, you know, the stars of the show and where they're going, but there were enough other people involved in the whole situation that I needed to have it pretty well mapped out. And then the funniest story on that was when I was doing the main games brackets, I got them all done, all put together, and then went oh, shit, and realized that I had not put the army team in anything. 
<laughs> so my apologies to Army again. Ruh-roh. We had to go back and <laughs> because I just completely left them out. Like I was like counting teams on my hands and suddenly went, wait a minute, we should have five teams. Not or six to I don't even know. I'm like, yeah, how many how many are there? Um, and realizing that I had not, like as I counted off names, that I had not talked about the army at all or put them in any of the competitions. So I feel like there is a great opportunity for fan art or tie-in uh merchandising here. Um, thinking about that chart, thinking about your bracket of all the characters, and also thinking about how, like, within the story, like, the boarding games end up being kind of a big deal in a, in a media sense. You've got, like, kids who have posters of some of these people. Jinx is somebody that people have on their wall because she's such a notable hand-to-hand fighter in these cage match combat situations. And so I just feel like somebody needs to make a thing where, like, you put jinx on one side and show like rosa with the sword on the other and then put the uh you know the the brackets in between and and all the you know the names of these different people on it and thankfully you crowdsource some so you didn't end up with like punchy mcfight face or somebody in there like you know. <laughs> right <laughs> This would have been awesome. I mean, I feel like if I was in your shoes doing that, that's exactly how like three quarters of those characters would be named until I had to actually get serious about it. Otherwise, you're going to come up with like a total word salad of like of just insane names trying to keep track of that many people. Well, and literally, that's how you end up with characters named Hobbs and Shaw. <laughs> Is it, <laughs> at some point, you're just like, you know what? Screw this. We're putting it in. Somebody will get it. Right. Sooner or later, it'll be noticed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I feel like there's a, I think there's a mention of like that Lewis um, Armstrong, who's one of the cage fighters on the, on the HQ team, it, it ha- his, one of his boys has, has a poster of Jenks. Um, and is like a huge fan of Jenks. And there's a, a, a running kind of joke that ends up in the second book um, where they're talking about the fact that his his kids, his twin boys are, are always talking about how Jenks is going to kick dad's ass. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it should be noted that this character is sort of a frequent hookup for Jenks as well. So somebody she has to compete against. Sometimes the post-competition stuff gets a little heated. A <laughs> little bit, yeah. <laughs> I got super lucky. Um, there's an artist whose name is Valentine Barker who does some amazing art. And he, I commissioned him to draw Max and Jenks for me. It is like the most beautiful thing when he showed me the rough and then when, and, and he literally did it. Like I sent him the manuscript and he read it and, and, and then drew like this beautiful, brought the two of them to life. And it is, it is so perfect and so much fun. And yeah, like having, having people do art and, Having all of that like merchandise tie in for the <laughs> for the boarding games is a lot of fun. <laughs> That's fantastic. I follow Valentine, so yeah, I, I I don't think I've actually spotted that in his feed, but I'm gonna have to go back and look for that because that's awesome. Yeah. That's very yeah. cool. Uh, before we wrap up, really quickly, I want to know what stuff outside of all this and like in the, all the free time you have when you're not working and writing and <laughs> you know bringing these things to life. What other media are you absorbing? What's feeding your writer brain right now? Oh, my, my writer brain is fried. Um, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) I, yeah, I have not, I have like 120 books on my to be read shelf. Um, and I I think I read like 13 books last year just because I did not have time between everything that I was working on. Um, and, uh, I have to be super careful watching shows, um, because I get, so easily sucked into things that it takes away from like, if I get sucked into somebody else's world, I can't create in my own. And so I, I kind of bounce back and forth right now. I'm playing in a a ridiculous amount of Assassin's Creed Odyssey uh, (laughs) because there is like something super oddly soothing about hiding in bushes, killing people. (laughs) Um, (laughs) there's a lot of stuff I want to watch. And I did like, I made allowances for the Mandalorian um, and kind of managed to like binge watch it between finishing one project and starting this next one. And then I've got a couple of other things that I really want to watch, like the, the dark crystal age of resistance, which I know came out like six months ago, but I watched the first episode and was so sucked in that was like, Oh, I can't, I got, <laughs> I'm going to have to back away from that one. Cause I will not, <laughs> it'll take away like four years of my life. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I'm, I am super brain dead. It's been a really exciting four years. Um, and all really exhausting. I I've written like, yeah, that when I finished this next Neo G novel in March, I will have written seven books in four years, which is kind of mind boggling, I guess. Um, and it does not leave a lot of room for anything else. So I'm looking forward to taking the rest of the year off and like refilling the well and <laughs> watching a bunch of stuff and reading a bunch of stuff and letting things settle and refilling the well. I feel like taking the rest of the year off sounds like a pipe dream that it's no way going to happen. Right. And basically, see, and you don't even know me. Everybody who knows me is like, yeah, right. Sure, Katie. We'll <laughs> believe it. And we're we're all ready. Yeah, I've, I've got books to pitch and – I'm still cursing Tasha Suri because she threw a King Arthur idea at me. And I, I don't even like King Arthur, but now I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> um, so we may see like gender bent King Arthur in space at some point here from me. And it's all her fault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's the danger. And I don't know if you fall anywhere near this, but it's the danger of having like an ADHD brain. It's like if somebody just tags you with an idea, you can't stop spinning on it afterwards. And like until it is realized in some fashion, it has to be explored. You can't let it lie. Damn you, Tasha Suri. How dare you? <laughs> yeah, basically that I am not. Yeah, I'm not ADHD or, or anything as far as I know, but I and I, I usually can like disregard ideas that are not interesting, but I woke up like three days in a row thinking about this story idea. And obviously, like I'm in the middle of another project. I can't stop working and write on this. And yet there's always that little voice in the back of your head. And when that thing really gets going, that's when you're like, oh, I guess I am going to have to put this in the queue somewhere. <laughs> I'm just not... Just not sure where. The background process has not quieted down. So, yeah, your brain is working on it whether you want it or not. Exactly. Once you start waking up in the middle of the night with, like, with the stuff spinning in your head or going to your partner and, and being like, okay, I, I just need you to listen to me brain vomit for the next 30 minutes. It won't make any sense to you, but just understand it has to happen. I have to do this. Yeah. They're very good about that, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, like I said, at the top, a pale light in the black arrives march 3rd from harper voyager uh and also like you mentioned you've got a, a backlog of other books um uh it sounds like you've got some from orbit uh so a lot for people to catch up on if this is their introductory work for you more neo g is on its way soon by the sounds of it so all of that is very exciting where should people be following you online so they can keep up with all of your stuff your news and new releases um, so they can find like a collection of stuff at my website, which is kbwagers.com. Um, I am on Twitter most days, same deal, kbwagers, ranting about all sorts of things. If that's your jam, <laughs> feel free to follow me. There are occasionally cat photos on there also. And uh, probably the other good place is uh, if you like, again, cat photos or pictures of plants, or also Baby Groot, um, I am on Instagram at Midway Brawler, which for anyone who's curious is my Jaeger name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can, there, is a, there is a KB Wagers on Instagram. It is my account, but I don't post over there. You like the active account is the Midway Brawler account. So yeah. And that's, that's a lot of plant photos. And then I also have a baby group that I do random poses with in various adventures. So. Well, that sounds very entertaining in and of itself. All right. <laughs> well, like I said, uh, Pale Light in the Black is, uh, is arriving here soon. And uh, KB, thank you for joining me on Fictitious. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This has been Season 5, Episode 2 of Fictitious. Listen and subscribe to Fictitious on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or search for the show using your favorite podcasting app. Every episode of the show is also available at fictitiouspodcast.com, along with news and events, articles, and more. You'll find the show on Twitter and Instagram as at fictitiouspod, or you can chat with me directly on my personal account at Adrian Buskey. 
If you enjoy Fictitious, please share this episode on your favorite social network, tell your book-loving friends, or write us a review. It all supports the authors who appear on the show, and you'll help me to grow the podcast. If you have a favorite author you'd like to hear on Fictitious, let me know, and tag that writer too while you're at it. My next interview will feature author Trisha Levenseller. Subscribe now so you don't miss it. I'm Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening to Fictitious. Fictitious. <laughs>